People who don't know how to contain bad news themselves will be contained. So we need to know how to shake off the beast into the fire. And so here are three people, and I'm sure already you're beginning to recall some of these three friends that you may have encountered. And in some cases, you might even recall where you were one of the three. But it's okay, because now the Bible says it's the day of salvation. And so now this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to give us a couple of pointers here so that we can be better alert and more discerning by the grace of God in order to apply discretion even when we are very zealous for the things of God and for the people of God. And so look at this. The Bible says that the name of the one was called Eliphaz the Temanite. So I want you to... I want, you, I want you to pay attention to something here. It's a good way to study scripture, wherein you recognize that every word is significant. You know, the Bible says each one came from his own. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hmm. Let me tell you something. The more you understand this mystery, the less people will surprise you. The Bible says everyone came from his own place. When you know where people are coming from, you know what to expect. Because everyone is coming, everyone is not coming from your own place. I had read this thing like maybe half a million times until I met my wife. And that was when I realized that, wow, this lady isn't coming from my own place. I used to say things like, oh, that's not how we used to do it. When I was growing up, we used to drink from that glass upside down. And I would say that all the time, all the time. You know, because myself and my siblings we were, we were quite close. And my parents, very expressive people. They can let you know how they feel. They can tell stories. Oh, my mom is an amazing storyteller. And my dad is very scientific. And so I grew up in an environment where we were always talking to one another, proving points and disproving points. You understand what I mean? And I thought that was the world. I thought it was just us. And everybody else was an NPC. When you, for those who play video games or who used to before they were redeemed, NPCs referred to non-playable characters. I just felt like we were the people. And everybody else was just like, okay, they're just there to make our world fun. So when I met my wife, everything I had an idea about, oh, this and that, this is how we used to do it. One day, she just said to me, she said, but you know, this is not your house where you grow, grew up. This is now our home. And that was when wisdom started to find a place to rest. You know, because sometimes you're so full of where you're coming from that wisdom is trying to alight on you. But you're like, oh, this is what my dad says. And then wisdom is like, okay, steady. No, this is what my mom says. But when she said that, I stood and I thought about it. Okay, wait a minute. This is no longer a house. This is now our home. Because everyone is coming from somewhere. So it is always good to know where people are coming from. And now you're about to see how these people's responses and the things that they did in the life of Job and how they did it was because of where they were coming from. Now, one of them, the Bible says his name was Eliphaz the Terminite. Now, let's look at where Eliphaz was coming from. You see, the Bible did us a favor already that Eliphaz, that each one of them was coming from his own place. Eliphaz the Terminite, Eliphaz means Gold is my God. Temanite is Timani, which means the south. Remember, those three people come from the west, the east, and the south. East, west, and south. Eus. Eus. You see, he came in with the perspective of material sentiments he came in with material sentimentality because gold is his god and it's coming from the south the south from biblical terms usually refers to the economy of the world system that is the reason why the bible says woe unto them who go down to egypt for help 
You understand what I mean? Because your prosperity comes from where? The Bible says my help does not come from the west, the east, nor the south, but it comes from, the Bible never said the north there, simply because that's where God is. David said, I will lift up my head to the hills. From where has come, come my help? For my help does not come from east, west, or south, but it comes from the north, the northern city of the great king. So God expects you to look up for your providence as opposed to go south for your sustenance. But this person worships money. So that's where he's coming from. And he took it very personal. How can you lose all that money? It doesn't matter what Job was saying about God. He didn't care. As far as he was concerned, no, you must have done something. People don't just lose money like that. We guard our gold very jealously. You must have. That was the reason why he kept insisting that Job must have done something. Because he was so concerned about the money, he couldn't care about the God. And so some people, if you don't know where they're coming from, you will keep butting heads with them. But then if you know where they're coming from, you're like, oh, he's from the south. If we're not talking money, he's not here. All he cares about is world economy. And by so doing, guess what happens? You have identified the person. Either they're a man, a dog, or swine. So now, you manage yourself differently. Now, let's look at one more friend. Or we can even take the two more friends. It's still it's just about 8 p.m. Central. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, look at what Bildad means. Bildad means... Confusing love. People who have wanting passions. They keep mistaking the love of God or the love of things for the love of God. Some people you think the reason why they serve even in the local church is because they love God. But the reality, no, it's not because they love God. It's because they love to be seen. They love fame. So they have a confusing love because they mingle things. The word literally means to mingle things. And where is Mr. Bildad from? Bildad is the Shuite. He's from, he's from Shuhi, which means to see wealth. Now, when somebody that you think is preaching the gospel because He's called by God, is then revealed to you by God as one who is a wealth chaser. Then it's going to make sense the reason why half of the so called message was about selling the book behind the stage. You see, because sometimes you're like, wait a minute, why is my spirit wrestling? Why am I unable to open up to this person? He's speaking eloquently, and there is wisdom in what he's saying. But this is Bildad, who has confused the love for instruction with the love for remuneration. Because the man is from a place where they chase wealth. Think about it this way. You have friends who are always thinking about themselves. What they can get from you. They are wealth chasers. They want to take from you and add to themselves. They never want to give anything to you. They are people that are called builders. They have confusing love because they end up confusing you because you don't even know whether they love you or they love your attention. And finally, I mean, these things you can get even deeper into them. And then we have Zohar, the Naamatite. Let's see where this man is from. The name Zohar or Zophar means a sparrow. And then Naamatite is a word, Naamah, which means pleasantness. Zophar, that is from a place of what? Pleasantness. Now, who are these friends? 
You see, one of them is chasing gold. One of them is chasing wealth. It just, they just want to add to themselves. But you have people who are in your life only when it is pleasant. They are sparrows. They do not labor for anything. They are looking for somebody to take advantage of. You see, these three friends of Job came from where? Their own place. It is not the place where God put them. God did not place any one of us in a situation wherein we're supposed to constantly seek our own pleasure by so doing only looking for things that are pleasant. We're supposed to be like our Heavenly Father who demonstrated through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that He is willing to go to the very hard places of life to, just to be able to sacrifice as a demonstration of His love. Willing to work for it. To bleed for it. As opposed to being a freelancing sparrow that just wants the pleasant side of life. I just want, when you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you. When everything is happening nice and dandy around you, if your name is being announced on the radio all the time, oh, that's my guy. <laughs> uh, and then the moment they kick you off the radio, they're like, I've always known there was something about that guy. You know, the people who say they've always known, my question is, if you have always known, then why were you dining with me? Hypocrite. If you have always known, why didn't you tell me? Did the Bible not say that open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed? So you say you have always known that there was something shady about me, but you never said a word. You came along when it was pleasant, while we were still printing t-shirts every other week. You came. But I will read one more verse to you from Job. Let's read verse 17 of the same Job chapter 2. No, not verse 17, 13. The Bible says, So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was great. I want to say this to you folks. No matter how much people want to console you, no matter how much they want to comfort you, no matter how much they try to satisfy you, the Lord remains, He alone remains your strength. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Why am I bringing this up? When we get into the matters of human interaction and relationships and how, how we deal with people, I started out by telling us that it is important for us to, to be mature in our dealings with people because it affects our dealings with God. It affects our dealings with God because God says, if someone has ought against you, why are you coming here? You haven't even been able to agree on this level. Now you want to come up here. God says, make peace. That person that has something against you, was made in my image and in my likeness. They may not be all right right now, but they will be. So you play your part in honoring that relationship. The Bible says, he that is unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, who will give to him the eternal riches of the kingdom? We beg for God's attention, but people are begging for ours. We need to give our attention to others, but it is critical for us to understand how best to give it so that we are not casting pearl before swine. Why is Jesus, or why did Jesus take his time to break down the classes and the categories? It's because he wants us to master it because we are required to do it. We are required to share our precious things with people. The pearls, it just has to be done right. We are required to share holy things with people. That was what he did with his disciples. He broke that holy bread and he shared it with them. We're supposed to be like that communion. We're supposed to share of ourselves with other people. But it has to be done right. And so because your relationship with God is very much 
your relationship with people plays a significant role in your relationship with God. It is important for us to understand it. But the reason why I read that verse 13 is because in that verse 13, it shows us something that is actually conversely true. And what does that mean? We are not supposed to expect to come from people what can only come from God. Many of us are very godly in our character. Oh, wow, look at that. Good to see you. That is my sister, Roberta. Good to see you and your family. Praise God. It is important for us to understand that however, you see, some of us are very good with people. We have studied. We have applied ourselves to wisdom. We have applied our hearts to understanding we deal very well with people and by so doing, many of us have friends that are close to us that we are at peace with regardless of where they have come from. They may have come from the south. They may have come from pleasantness. They may have come from a place of wealth or wealth seeking, but you have mastered how you deal with them. But guess what? That could also be to your detriment. Now, let me say this again. What did we just read? The Bible says that they were getting along because they were together for seven days. Guys have to be getting along to be together for seven days. Otherwise, someone would have picked up and gone to play golf. The other person would have gone home back to his wife. So they were getting along given the situation. It means Job was a man of understanding enough to be able to deal with these people even though they were coming from places outside of his own. You understand what I'm saying? They were dealing with places outside of his own. He was coming from a place wherein he was pleasing to God and his desire was to please God. Apart from what we read about him and how the Lord made a boast in him, the Bible says that he was the wealthiest man in the East. When you see the word East and God is telling you that there is a man there, he's talking about the fact that the man is where he put him because when he was to place man in the beginning, the Bible says he planted a garden East of Eden and there he planted the man. Where was Job coming from? Job was coming from the will of God from pleasing God. He was coming east of Eden. But these other guys, they were coming from all of these other places. And yet he was able to deal with them adequately. Now, that is not a bad thing unless you don't know this next thing. If you get along with people, it's a good thing, but then it is also a very dangerous thing because after a while, you're so comfortable and so satisfied with being with those guys that you no longer have an appetite for God's companionship. You see, that is a balance that needs to be struck and made very clear. You see, because we can teach on the subject of understanding human behavior, of understanding where people are coming from, understanding how to deal with people, how to identify the dogs and the swine so that you're not casting your prowl before swine, so that you're not getting your things torn by dogs. But it is also important for you to know that once you have that going for you, you still just use people for what people are for so that you can still receive from God when it comes to what God is for. Praise the Lord. You see, when I say use people, I don't mean use people. I'm saying to take people for what they are. Friends, companions, but don't expect your joy to come from them. Seven days, and they were all sorrowful. Seven days, there was no answer. Seven days, they had only questions. And the situation got worse. Until Job lifted up his face to God, he suddenly remembered that, uh, actually, I've spent enough time talking to just you people. Now I need to talk to God. Because some of us, we have friends that care about us so much that by the time we see we have this problem, the way they rise up, the way they get up, and the way they listen to us, we just feel like, okay, now I'm heard. No, you are heard, but you still need to be heard. I talk to my wife all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about this and thinking about that. You know, but then she would always remind me. Okay, now let's pray about it. 
Because there are times where in the way she listens and some counsel that she provides, I feel like, okay, yeah, we're good. But I need to do that first because it's heaven's requirement to be at peace with all men because it qualifies me to see the face of God. So I'm not just going to stop at being at peace with all men. It's almost as if someone tells you, oh, if you do this and do that, we'll give you a ticket to go and watch the show. And then you get the ticket, you put it in a frame, and you start taking selfies with it. No, it's supposed to take you somewhere else. So being at peace with all men is supposed to take you before your heavenly father. Follow peace with all men and holiness with that which no man shall see God. Because if you don't have that orientation and expectation, you will end up ruining those relationships because you will put a burden on those people to deliver what is God's to give. Many of us have ruined relationships because people were good and you were great. And you guys got along so well. But you didn't know when to stop drawing from them and start drawing from God. Because if you keep drawing from people, after a while, there's not going to be enough for them, nor you. But if you know how to draw, like the Bible says, here a little and there a little. In closing, as we break bread today, I want to remind us of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. So the next time you're about to ask of anyone or ask anything, ask yourself or remind yourself, thank you, that there is a guarantee that you will receive if you would ask. So if you are asking for an argument so that you can appear right, you will get an argument, but you just may not appear right for long. If we would take those into account in all of our dealings with people, Father, we thank you. The Lord just reminded me again of the significance of recognizing that Jesus, what he gave was himself. And we call it the Holy Communion. We need to learn how to give ourselves without being defined. We need to learn how to lay our lives down and still be holy. Many of us, because of the zeal for the house of God, we have given ourselves to people, but then we have allowed ourselves to be defiled. You say things like, oh, I used to enjoy serving. I used to enjoy this and that. But after what people did to me, now I'm just going to stay at home. When you went out, you had the good intentions. To give of yourself, but you did not remain holy. Simply because you allowed yourself to be profaned. Jesus gave himself and he was still holy. And so tonight as we break bread together, I want you to say to the Lord. Ask him to preserve you like he preserved Jesus. When David was prophesying about Jesus, he says, my, my Lord, the Lord will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. God has asked me to give myself to others. He has asked me to, to give holy things to others, to share, because freely have I received, therefore I would give freely. He has asked me to also share my pearls with other people. But he wants me to remain holy and wants the pearls to remain unstained. And so how I will be preserved in giving of myself to others, in receiving and welcoming others like Job welcomed his friends. How I am able to do that without losing the holiness and without soiling the pearls is in the hand of my heavenly father, the one who is my shield and my buckler. And said, Lord, wherever you go, wherever you send, I will go, but you are the keeper of Israel. Keep me. You are the one who kept your holy one from seeing corruption. Keep me. Let me not sustain hurt that I cannot let go of. Let me not 
sustain unforgiveness. Let me not retain malice. Let me not be defiled. Let me not be angry for longer than the rising of the sun. Let me forgive and let go of the anger before the sun sets. I will go. I will give myself to others. I will serve. I will love on them. I will receive and welcome their love. But Lord, I will not be defiled by any sentiments. I will not be defiled by the wrong attitude because holiness is the purity of character. My character will remain pure. Lord, in the areas wherein my character may have been dented, you also are the restorer. Restore my brokenness and keep me from the evil ones. In the mighty name of Jesus, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. How many people like the, um, the, the com God's confidence in Job? You may want to share that with your friends. Yeah. Because um, it's such a good thing. I don't want us to keep it to just us here. God is good. Alrighty. So, um, what's he called? Alan's going to come up to receive the offerings. And, um, alrighty, praise the Lord. I was just making sure that what I was thinking of saying is right, the right time, but I think I need to hold up for a little bit, but, um, Alan's going to come and receive the offerings. But before I get down from here, it's been on my heart for a while now. And since Alan's taking his sweet time, I'm just going to quickly sneak in another verse of scripture. From Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. Okay, I'm going to sneak in another scripture as a way of leaving us or sending us off today with a prophetic update. Um, the prophetic update of Saturday, uh, I hope that the Lord allows for us to get deeper and deeper into it because we, we started to expose and to reveal something really new, something completely new. But the, the summary of that expression in... Um, in, 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 in the message wherein we were reading from Jeremiah and the Lord talking about listening to the king, obeying the king, and not obeying the false prophets. The premise of all of that is that God is testing hearts to see how flexible we are. No, not flexible, how agile we are whenever he changes course. You understand what I mean? Because... The requirement for being led by the Spirit, one of the primary requirements for being led by the Spirit is agility. You have, you have to be agile. How did Jesus say that? He said, as the, the wind blows where it wishes, so is anyone that is led by the Spirit. When you're led by the Spirit, you cannot be a robot. Because there are times when God would change course. Himself does not change, but he can change very quickly. Just so that he knows the people who are in his wind. As opposed to the people who are running off with their own instruction. You know, one of the ways by which I explain it to Alan is this. When you tie a stone to a string and you keep spinning it around a pivot, around a center. What happens is if someone cuts the rope or the string, what happens to the stone? The stone continues to fly on its own tangent. When it takes off, it feels free and it feels good. But then after a while, it loses all that momentum because it was not itself, it was not powering itself. And that's what happens to people in the move of God. So many revivals that have broken out since the days of the apostles have been like stones that went on their own tangent. Because people start having meetings every night and almost every member of town or every person in town comes to the meeting. People start coming from everywhere. They get baptized in water. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit wants to shut down the meeting to do something else. But men want to keep moving on their own tangent. And the Holy Spirit is like, uh, let's see how far you get with that. 
Because you need to stay connected with me. He is our CEO unto the day of redemption. We're not supposed to break ranks. Moses discovered that early on in his ministry. And he said, Lord, if we don't see you move, we're not going anywhere. We're tethered to you. And God was like, I was hoping so. Because God knows that we don't stand a chance without him. The Bible says, in him all things consist. And so, what I was teaching on Saturday, to some of us, sounds very different to what I taught in 2020 when it comes to taking a stand on the word of prophecy against whatever is coming from Nebuchadnezzar. But the king is different now. This is the one that the Lord calls his beloved. This is the one that the Lord calls Nebuchadnezzar. And he will be opposed by false prophets. But the Lord says, I want you to listen to the king. Now, that is what I call pivoting. And the Lord wants to know whether you want to listen to yourself, others, or him. It is a test. Let's not get self-conceited. Let us just learn how to be good shepherds, good sheep who know, or good flock who know the voice of the good shepherd. So if you didn't listen, or if you haven't listened to that message, if you weren't here, go and listen to it again, and all of this epilogue is going to make sense to you. Now, along the same line, very quickly, Matthew eleven seven, and it's, it's got to be very quick, actually, Matthew eleven seven. The Bible says, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? A reed shaken by the wind. Who sent John the Baptist? God. The Bible says that he will come before the Messiah. The Bible says before the Messiah comes, Elijah must come first to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Elijah came and Jesus says, if you have the heart to receive it, John was Elijah that was promised to come because when angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, he was quoting the prophecy of, I think it was, was it Micah who said that Elijah was coming. And he said to him, he says, you, your wife is going to be with child and the name of the child shall be called John and he will turn the heart. And so he recited everything that they said was going to be Elijah's. But Zechariah did not have a heart to receive it. So he had to be made deaf and dumb. He, he, he was made mute. Now, let me say this. It is important for us to understand that when Jesus told his disciples, if you have the heart to receive it, was because he was giving them the allowance to not be made mute. If you have the heart to receive it, receive it. If you don't, just keep going, but don't resist. <laughs> I'm going to say that again very quickly. Jesus did not say to them, Elijah is John, period. Because he knew them and he knew how hard that would be for them to receive. Because Elijah was taking up in a chariot of fire. And they were expecting him to come back the same, but now he came through the womb of a woman. And so that was too much for them already. But so that it is not too much for them like it was for Zechariah, because Zechariah heard, in fact, let's quickly look at it. I think it's Malachi chapter 4 verse uh, 6, is it? I think it's Malachi. I want to make sure that I give you the reference so that you can go and read it on your own. Okay, yeah, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of their children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, when you read the introduction of the birth of John the Baptist, that was what was said by the angel of the Lord to John the Baptist that John was going to do. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. But because of all the questions on the way, it's 
going to happen, Zechariah was a priest. Remember, he was a Zadok priest. I think he was a Zadok priest. So he knew scripture and he knew prophecy. And that particular prophecy, they knew it like the back of their hand. Why? Because that was the last thing God said for 400 years. Because after Malachi spoke, there was no more word. The Bible says, until the angel Gabriel came, bringing word concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus, there was no word from heaven for 400 years. So do you think they forgot the last thing that was said? The last thing that was said was the forerunner would come. And the first thing that happened was what? In the New Testament, the forerunner came. He came before Jesus was born. So God picked up where he left off. Left off. There was a 400-year gap. Why did he do that? Because God is accustomed to padding salvation with 400 years. 400 years before the Exodus, right? Before their salvation out of Egypt. How many years? 400 years from the time God gave the word to Abraham to the time that they left, 400 years. From the time he gave the word to Malachi, that the day of the Lord was coming, till John, I mean, Zechariah received the word, how many years? 400 years. It's just the way God operates, okay? But what I've just read to you, which I want you to pay attention to, because I know God is about to start to speak to some of us here and to reveal some of the new things that he wants us to position for, he doesn't want you to resist so that you are not made mute. John, I mean, Gabriel said to Zechariah, this is going to happen. And Zechariah was like, oh, I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's accurate. I mean, how is that even going to happen? He said, how is that going to happen from a perspective of somebody who is knowledgeable? Let me explain. You need to interpret scripture with scripture. The Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, right? Because people have wondered, are the angels of God, particularly an archangel like Gabriel, can someone like that be chauvinistic? Because the same question that Zechariah had that made him mute was what Mary had asked. And Gabriel started to explain away like a professor. And people are like, oh, come on, when the guy asked it, you were angry, you made him mute. But when the lady asked it, what's your intention? Are you picking and choosing? No. When Zachariah asked, he asked from a place of knowledge that made him puffed up. He was asking as somebody who knew. But Mary asked as someone who did not know. She was just a naive virgin girl that may not even have been allowed in the temple one time. So when she said, how will these things be? It was different from... Oh, how is it even going to happen? When you say, how is it even going to happen? And you feel like you know it all. The, his mouth was zipped because the angel of the Lord did not even want any foolishness to come out of that mouth again until the child was born. Don't ruin this thing if you can't help this mission. Because after asking a question in pride or out of pride, every other thing is destructive. Because the Bible says, after pride has gone, then comes destruction. So when something is not productive, what is it? It is an idle word. Now, we explained that at the beginning, remember? And the Bible says, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account. So the angel of the Lord did not want Zechariah to be guilty of an idle word. He zipped his mouth. But when Jesus told his disciples, he says, if you have the heart to receive it, John is Elias or Elijah that is to come. And he kept moving. Remember how, how smooth he was? Jesus was very smooth. He dropped it and he kept moving. Simply because he didn't want that to become an impediment in their way. If you have the heart to receive it, receive it. If you don't, keep moving. Don't question it. Don't resist it. Because that resistance will attract a zipper on your mouth. Why am I explaining that to you? God is about to show things to us. Saturday was just a glimpse. I was telling Alan, we were talking about it. This is new territory. Saturday's message was a, was a glimpse. And once that has begun, I'm not sure if you were following, but let me take two more minutes to explain this to you. On Saturday, before I started to give you that prophetic word, about Nebuchadnezzar and about the king that once was, that wasn't, but now is, what did I tell you? 
I stood here in the unction of the Holy Spirit and I said to you, my mission is to produce after my own kind that God is raising prophets from amongst you. The Holy Spirit instructed me to give that preamble because of the fact that the way that I am seeing into the activities of Nebuchadnezzar, you will begin to see and he doesn't want you to resist. So that is the reason why I'm reading to you Matthew 11, 7 today because Jesus said to them, who did you go to the wilderness to see? There was one time that you went into the wilderness to see John, but now you're with me. That was a pivot. And it happened so quickly. It didn't take years. John's disciples started, to, some of them started to follow Jesus the very first day that Jesus showed up. Andrew was like, what about the other disciples of John who did not leave John after Jesus had been revealed to be the son of God? What happened to them? Do you know when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says the heavens were open and God the Father spoke after the Holy Spirit alighted on Jesus saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it was already said that John was the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. If the preparer has finished his work, the Lord has not been revealed. What are you still doing with John? The Lord changed course and the religious people got hung up on John and they became a burden to John himself. You know what religious people like to do? Can I shock you? It's not even going to shock you because you, you live in America. Religious people want to get into politics. Righteous men want to get into government. There's a difference between being in government and being in politics. Being in government is seeking constructive ways to be of service to people. Being in politics is taking advantage of that overall structure. So, religious people, what do they do? When John the beloved came, the Bible says, Behold the voice of him crying in the wilderness. And Jesus attested to the ministry of John. Jesus says, John came preaching repentance. But then after Jesus appeared, he was supposed to hang his boots. Perhaps himself was supposed to follow Jesus. But guess what he did? He stayed because some of his disciples were too married to him to go with the Lord. Let me explain. Andrew was one of the foremost disciples of John the Baptist. And the moment Andrew saw John looking in a particular direction, Leaning over to them and saying to them, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, John said it before the Lord spoke. Just as Malachi said, that John, Elijah's voice will precede that of the Lord. He spoke, and what did he say? On that day. On that day. What did he say? Okay, let me explain something because I, I, I feel like I need to clarify this. What we read in Malachi says, Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What is the great and dreadful day of the Lord? What makes it dreadful? The great and dreadful day of the Lord, Jesus says, when you see the earthquakes, look up because you will see the Son of Man. And John described that even further. John says the heavens will be torn open and all eyes will see him. God gave us a demonstration of the great and dreadful day when Jesus was baptized by John because the Bible says the heavens were open. And God spoke and the Holy Spirit came and descended upon Jesus. Right? So we're talking about the same day, but on different days. Okay? Because it had to happen. Because he's the one that was and is and is to come. So certain things about Jesus had to happen two to three times before they're established with men. Because he's the word of God. Two to three times. He was slain before the foundations of the world. He was slain again when? I mean, at Calvary. Right? Two times. And the Bible says that everybody who denies him, slays him again. You understand what I'm saying? So now, I will say that. Let me finish this issue of John. Because there are Johns that are being raised amongst us. And we cannot miss, we cannot afford to miss our destiny. When John's mission was to introduce Jesus. Michelle, if your, in, your mission is to introduce Shannon. Once Shannon's introduced... Are you going to stand on the stage also? 
If it's like, okay, well, Shannon's about to come take the offering, everybody, let's celebrate Shannon. Woo, 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 woo. And Shannon comes, and then Michelle is still there holding the microphone. Ma'am, you were supposed to just introduce her. What are you doing? John introduced Jesus. But the disciples of John, they were like, maybe he has his own assignment, this Jesus dude, but you're still the man. And you know what that, what, what that did to John? He turned John to a politician. And that was what got his head cut off. And you know, I've explained to you before that Elijah ran to heaven because Jezebel wanted to cut his head. He escaped the first time because he was doing the will of his father. When he came the second time, Jezebel was still looking for him, but couldn't find him because he was about his father's business at the Jordan. But the moment he allowed himself to stay in the place of revival after the Lord had left, he was no longer in the company of the saints because the saints, what do they do? They move with the cloud. He was left with religious people who wanted to double into politics. And the Bible says, and then John began to speak against Herodias. And Herod, because of what he had done with his brother's wife, what is your business? You're a prophet. You're a prophet, not a blogger. What is your business talking about Herod and whose wife he took? How is that the kingdom? And how is that even the gospel? The Bible says the moment he doubled into the politics, Jezebel located him. And they said, there it is. That is Elijah. We've been looking for this dude for like 900 years. We knew he was coming back. We knew he was coming back. Now, we are getting him. And what did, what did they do to him? Remember, what was the end of John the Baptist? They cut his head. The danger of sticking with religion after the Lord has moved is that you will be silenced. Zechariah was silenced. Elijah in John was also silenced. So I say this to say, there was a time that we went to the wilderness to see John. But Jesus says, now you are with me. We need to move with the cloud. It may sound weird, strange, unconventional, definitely unorthodox. The things that God is about to start to say to us here at Communion House and beyond to the very many tents that have been situated by the Lord in the places where he is raising his watchmen, both the ones that are already on the tower and the ones that are climbing. The Lord is saying that each one of them will receive a scroll. But we need to learn how to pivot so that we do not lose our message. I say that to you today because there is a mandate upon me to raise other prophets. And I know that God has you here so that you can receive this word of instruction to function in your place by the same function. We have moved from the time of John. Now we are with Jesus. God bless you. Alana. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise again. What a word tonight. I'm not going to hold this. We got a lot to soak in, if you will. The tithes and offerings are on the screen to our family online. Several ways to give. Cash App, Dollar Sign, Communion House, PayPal, at Communion House, as well as the Zelle information there. Let's give in faith tonight for what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. God is so good. If you need an offering envelope, it's here to your left by our dear brother Kenyatta. Father, we give you praise. Lord, there is none like you. We're privileged, O oh God, to be a part of this house that you, by your hand alone, have built, O oh God, as your mouthpiece, speaking your word. Lord, granting unto us the ear to hear, to understand, Lord, what your spirit is saying. And we say unto you tonight, O creator of heaven and of earth, there is none like you. We're so thankful, O God, how you've kept us, how you've dealt with us this season. And Lord, we receive by your prophet, O God, this transition and season, O God, 
that we may bring glory to your name. Look upon these offerings, O oh God, these tithes, and what you have instructed us to do. We thank you, even now, for the cheerful heart to give. O oh Lord, be light unto our feet to what you have called us to do. Now, Lord, let these offerings, these tithes, O oh God, be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. We declare that all glory and honor and power and might belong to you. And we all said amen and amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord once more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't forget, we will be online tomorrow night, 9 p.m., Instagram Live. And I want to prepare us ahead of time. We will be praying in behalf of Communion House. So I want to go ahead and just uh, help us to posture ourselves uh, to, to really press into what that looks like, what the Lord has been doing here um, as a watchman, you see. Uh, and so I want us to be encouraged. If you haven't been online with us, please join us. We have a great time just praying in the Holy Ghost, and we'll go from there. All righty? Everyone have a blessed night.